Good morning, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we are starting our session on the enhancing connectivity in the Central Asia. Uh, first of all, I would like to pass special thanks to Dr. Frank Richter, uh, Chairman of Horasis, for, the, for providing this opportunity for us to express our views on the region uh, where I'm originally from and other speakers that somehow related in their life and business career. And uh, region, we are here today, we are talking about the Central Asia, not as usual, usually we are discussing Greater Caspian region, but this time we decided to concentrate exactly on the Central Asia, uh, because Central Asia is the region where countries, are, all of the countries, they are landlocked. And that's why it's very important uh, to discuss uh, about the logistics connectivity of the region with the big world. And, uh, I would like to introduce uh, our speakers today. Uh, first, is, uh, first speaker will be Martin Voitman, uh, who is the uh, member of the board of DP Vault in Kazakhstan and responsible for all commercial activity of DP Vault there. Uh, he had extensive uh, career in logistics. Uh, uh, he was leading companies like FESCO in Kazakhstan, also Almaty International Logistics Park. Uh, a Mediterranean shipping company in Novorossiysk and uh, Kazakhstan. And uh, uh, right now, he, there is a project of DP World for development of the Tau port uh, and uh, various related projects to this. Uh, this was uh, uh, somehow the part of the Belt and Road Initiative, which we'll discuss later. And, uh, oh, uh, Martin disappeared. Uh, but I uh, hope he will be able to jo rejoin again. Uh, I will, meanwhile, I will introduce the other speaker, Aftab Khatib, uh, who is uh, the Vice President for Commerce for Caspian Container Company. Uh, the company which is really trying to connect Central Asia and the Greater Caspian region with the big world via container transportation. But, uh, and the third speaker we have is Christian Ophibi, uh, head of strategy of Integra Group. Uh, he will tell us about uh, uh, innovative project, uh, how to connect producers in the Great Caspian region and the users worldwide, uh, enabling small and medium enterprises still uh, be involved in the commodity trading. And uh, I will give more comments later, but now the floor is for Martin. Uh, and uh, what are your views what, uh, based on your experience and based on your professional activity in the region? Uh, what could be done? Uh, what are the current situation with the connectivity? Which problems you see and what could be done to solve these problems? Uh, and uh, uh, which projects prob probably need to be initiated in the region or uh, late development and uh, all other useful information you would like to pass to the audience? Please, Matt. Thank you. Thank you very much, Murat. And thank you very much for inviting me on, uh, on this session. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's indeed, as, as we just spoke, uh, an impressive list of speakers. And I'm very, very happy to be able to be among, uh, among one of those. Um, so Central Asia, when we talk about connectivity, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a nice word because it really, it really encompasses the whole, the, whole, the whole bigger picture of the issues that we have in Central Asia. It's not just an infrastructure issue. It's not just a question of the soft, uh, the soft qualities that we need to make this run. It really is a question of, connect of connectivity on, on all levels, in between human, human beings as, as persons, between companies and bet on uh, the companies trading in and out and the companies doing the logistics in and out of the region. Um, I'm of the opinion that it's probably the most difficult place in the world to do logistics. Uh, I cannot think of any other place in the world where you have this much ambiguous, where you have this many players that you need to connect with each other, where you have this big uh, difference, let's say cultural difference between the, 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 the people and the companies you need to, to get together in order to move cargo, be that bulk or, or liquid or containers. You really need to have a whole range of stakeholders uh, aligned in order to move this cargo out of the region. Um, and this is this is the real the real challenge. It's not just finding the lowest price or finding a, a truck that can go from A to B. It's really this about connecting all of the stakeholders in the process. Um, and as Murad, you touched upon in the beginning as well, it's the region where we have uh, well 
we have Liechtenstein, I think it is as well, right, in in Europe, that's also double landlocked, but otherwise it's the only double landlocked in the country, which is Uzbekistan. And that is a very nice, very nice picture showing that it's 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 immensely, in in my opinion, immensely complex to do to do the to do the let's say ordinary logistics in and out. Um, what we have seen lately, uh, lately means within the last five to six years, is a uh, quite aggressive investment on behalf on uh, on behalf of the governments in and around. If take uh, if we speak around uh, around Central Asia. Both Kazakhstan as well as Turkmenistan has invested quite large amounts of money into developing their infrastructure. Uh, Turkmenistan developed a whole new new port, a state-of-the-art, fantastic port, by the way. Um, Azerbaijan also invested into into building a new port, Port of Ayat. Uh, Kazakhstan has built and are still uh, building up the the capacities along the border with China. So there's there's billions being invested into infrastructure in Central Asia, which is, uh, well, with, with the danger of being a little, little bit political uh, about time, because we have known for, I mean, since the independence of, of the countries from the Soviet Union, that the single biggest problem for doing business in Central Asia is logistics. Nevertheless, the governments have been a little bit slow to really, to really get, get into this investment mode and start to really seriously develop the infrastructure. So one of the reasons why they they uh, they decided to come uh, to come into this investment mode and started actually to build up the infrastructure is this China Belt and Road Initiative. Suddenly, the, the, especially the Kazakhstan government saw, hey, we can make money from our geographical position. We can really start to become a transit nation. So if we if we build up the capabilities, we have a, a good um, a good chance to actually start to make some, making some money of this out of this. Um, like we briefly touched upon yesterday, that maybe the future is not necessarily so much within the Chinese transit. Uh, I personally think it's a very nice driver for this development. It's a good incentive for for Kazakhstan and for well for Russia as well, if we want to go a little bit that way. But also for the Caspian area, it's a good incentive for for the governments to do investment when they see. Look, it's not just a question of our own cargo we actually have a business case for building these ports. So we will attract more if we develop our infrastructure. Um, but on the backdrop of that, specifically what we are trying trying to push in, uh, in Port of Aktau is actually developing the infrastructure for the good of the Central Asian republics uh, on the backdrop of this Chinese push for the one build and one road. Uh, what we have achieved so far, if, if just to say, let's say historically, is we got the first uh, regular container shipping line up and running in the Caspian. This has never been done before. Not that it's that it's uh, let's say a super difficult thing, but but still, you need to have the, the base cargo in order to put a, a vessel that will then operate continuously. And uh, for us, this was these Chinese volumes that that allowed us to to basically convince all the stakeholders around the port that we have something here. We can actually build something that will lead to a sustainable business model for, for the port. And exactly what this has done for us means that whereas before we would not really be able to, to, to uh, offer cargo looking to go beyond the Caspian Sea, we, don't, we didn't really have anything to offer. Today, we can go to anybody and say, look, we have the feeder, we have the service, we can go via the Caspian Sea and out to the rest of the world. Uh, Murat, which is what you also said in the beginning, right? That this is this is what we what we're looking to do. What are the challenges? What are the let's say what are the the obstacles? Um, so we're there today, where we have an operational feeder line. Uh, I think it's one or two steps away. Then there would be a similar sh- uh, line going from Turkmen Bashi as well across to Baku. Um, I know that the, the, I mean, some of the some of the guys in Azerbaijan, in, in cooperation with Turkmenistan, I think CCC is also looking at something. Um, so, so I'm sure that within the next year we'll have a, a similar a similar shipping line. So we will actually have three regular container shipping lines, and this is within the last two years. Where before there was nothing, there will be three, even maybe four shipping lines. One going down to Iran, and the other ones across uh, to Baku. Um, where we are, let's say, a little bit hindered the, at the moment in our growth 
uh, is we have been focusing very much on coming across the mountain pass of uh, Akhaltalaki and Kars into Turkey. <coughs> um, and there are some, uh, some infrastructure problems at the moment because the Russian, uh, Russian uh, cargo base also started to move into Turkey via this mountain pass. So they have a little bit of infrastructure limitations there. Um, but the really, really big challenge we face is attracting operators, private container operators, because the infrastructure I can say today is there up until we reach, I don't know, 150, 200,000 TUs. Today we're around 30,000 TUs. So there's, there's place to grow, uh, but we need to have uh, private operators of container stock. This would be either the bigger shipping lines. Some of them are, are, are there today in, in, in the region. But private operators have a unique chance, in my opinion, here to actually open up a, a closed circuit line, which means that the containers stay within, within the round trip mode, uh, east to west bound, meaning from Central Asia towards Europe and Turkey and coming back. Because there is cargo both ways. Um, what we see is easily 100,000 TUs a year. That is there today being moved. Uh, this is actual statistics. They are not moved in containers, though. They are moved in a multitude of, of, of various other other modes, uh, starting from truck up to bulk, um, so on and so forth. So there is basically, uh, I mean, 100% for sure, there's a cargo base to do this. Uh, in our um, let's say calculations, the, the rates that we have at the moment, they are definitely competitive with this. Uh, it's all about container logistics. Because of these, let's say, vast vast um, distances in Central Asia, especially in Kazakhstan, where you, you discharge the container, for example, in Almaty, and you need it in Atsirao. That means you need to move, you have an empty move of around 2,500 kilometers. <laughs> and obviously that has a cost attached to it. So all of these issues, uh, I believe that is where a private container operator could do a big difference. Because today, a lot of what we do is hinged on the KTZ, on the various uh, railway uh, national railway companies in the area, and I think without again without getting too political, I think it's it's a universal truth more or less that the government does not do business efficiently. They may do it well, and there are issues where they have to be the investment into infrastructure has to be done at, at, at government level because it's it's not necessarily a straightforward commercial business case when you build a new railway line. So those issues have to be done by the government, but running the actual services, this is where, in my opinion, we definitely need private container operators, be it shipping lines, be it uh, the bigger freight forwarders or, or whoever it, it can be, but we need private container operators to come in and start to become service service providers for, for our area. This will, this will give us, let's say, in my opinion, the next boost we need. Because you need to have a commercial structure, not just inside Central Asia. You need to have a commercial structure in the companies that are in the countries where you're moving to and from. Uh, and this is where in where we are facing a little bit of, of lack because our service providers are government companies. Um, yeah, and, and they are not commercially at the level where, where in my opinion, they need to be. Um, last what I expect we would be able to also get with a private operator is transparency. So efficiency, we also already touched upon, but transparency is an issue as well. So when you put a container in at one end of, uh, of the transport corridor, in many cases, you won't hear any news about this container <laughs> until it comes out at the other end. So along all the, the transshipment points, we don't have the, the tools yet. Uh, in order to provide a, a transparent uh, transport process. Um, I think this is, you know, I know this is one of the issues we are, we are working on and we're going to be attacking over the next uh, half a year, year. Uh, so hopefully we can bring this transparency. Again, with a, with a skillful uh, private operator, these issues will also be able to be handled uh, facing the client. Um, so if to, if, to stay, uh, if to stay short, this is basically what, what I see, where we came from, where we are today, and, and, and what we need to, to grow further in the future. 
Thank you, Martin, for the extensive uh, info, explanation of the of the situation in the region. I have several questions already to you. I decided not to wait till the all speakers uh, uh, speeches. Uh, first, uh, I know that Actau Port was uh, organization you actively cooperating with uh, from DP Vault uh, is the found member of the Middle Corridor or TMTM Association. Uh, and uh, you mentioned uh, about the multi-stakeholder schemes and so on. Uh, how this association is involved in your activity and uh, how uh, they're helping uh, to develop and enhance the connectivity? Well, I would say that this is the driving force uh, behind us being able to put the shipping line in place and, and starting to service this corridor. Uh, so we came from, from zero to use along along this or let's say maybe a hundred per year up to up to around thirty thousand this year uh, this is only because of this i i don't to use a a modern word because of this platform it's an association but it allows us to bring together all these stakeholders in in one place and sit down and, and agree what is it we need to do to make this work if if we as the port or whoever it, it, it may be needed to travel around to each stakeholder or you know it, it, it just wouldn't possible so it allows us to get everybody together in the same room decision makers in the same room and say hey this is what we think we should do what do you think and then we over the course of a couple of days make the, the discussions and, and finish and we sign a piece of paper and the next day rates service parameters and, and whatnot is in place as, as a sellable packaged product um, and this is definitely because of, of, of the TMTM. So there was Trasica before this. It was a little bit, or it still, it still exists. This is a little bit of a different business model. That was more up to each member. Do we want to participate? Do we want to do? Do we want to be in there? That had its own, uh, let's say, its own successes, but the TMTM is really what, what, what drove this forward. Um, so definitely that has had a, a very big impact. Uh, it means they are really contributing uh, to the connectivity of the region. Absolutely. Uh, and I saw also these block trains from Europe to China, and uh, which was a very good initiative. Uh, and, uh, and I think now a lot of uh, cargo is already going, uh, what I see. And uh, I already hearing the uh, good opinions about this project. Okay, the next question you mentioned about transparency. I will also add traceability. Uh, how to involve modern digital technologies uh, in the in the logistics in the Central Asia? What do you think? Uh, because of course now uh, blockchain technologies, artificial intelligence, and so on. Uh, somebody, as per your knowledge, somebody really massively doing this in the in the Central Asian countries, or it, it should be done uh, in the nearest future? Because transparency, besides the good work of the logistic operator, uh, now we're in the 21st century. Uh, that's why everything could be placed on blockchain and you will see on, uh, live and online. Where is your container? What is it doing? And uh, put some sensors on it. It's a yes. quite simple technology already developed. Uh, whether this technology already been implemented in the region or the, how, if not, then how this should be done and where and more, more by whom maybe. So this is again, we, we have a partner who shipped block trains from China into, into Caucasus across Aktau. Uh, and they put in the GPS tracking devices in, uh, in every sixth container of the block train. And, and they ran the test successfully. Uh, they could see it all along the way. They claimed there were no glitches. Uh, usually this is my concern. Even GPS in our area uh, may not exactly catch the, the, the signal. It, uh, but but they, they say it worked all along the line. They had live feed from the GPS trackers all along. Uh, and they have a system that, that can allow. But okay, this is, this is a, single, uh, a single user platform in the sense that this will then only be this specific company that will be able to supply this tracing. Uh, we need, in my opinion, at least if we're talking about the TMTM or, or what comes across the Caspian, there needs to be a centralized, uh, a centralized platform that can provide this sort of serp service even openly or I would prefer openly without any cost to it because this is something we're trying to develop. We want to, to become a little bit uh, yeah, more transparent and be able to trace the car. So I know that in the TMTM we're speaking, or I, I'm personally speaking to the World Bank, uh, they have uh, something that <laughs> we call it POP. <laughs> uh, 
it's a little bit a lot of the rings sort of a platform to rule all the platforms <laughs> and uh, pop um so why this is needed uh, is because we have political issues as well in the region so if 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 the kazakhstan railways would come and say look we have a platform that can work automatically georgians and and, and turkish and, and azerbaijan they're going to say look no thank you we're not going to give our data into your platform and same thing the other way around if azerbaijan would come to kazakhstan look we have a product Kazakhs will say, no, look, we have our own. So the World Bank is, is a fantastic instrument for this, to come in as a, um, as a definitely non-partial player and say, look, we have a product. I, I, I think that this is something that, that most of the parties at least involved would be able to sign on to. And this will give transparency and the traceability of the cargo. Uh, in terms of a timeline, uh, I mean, your guess is as good as mine. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it's very good that already somebody tried to initiate such project. Of course, for the train, uh, it, it could be much more easier than for the trucks, uh, because trucks are spread uh, in the region on the like 5 million square kilometer. And train, uh, there is the railway line, everybody knows where it is. And uh, that's why even I thought, think it was not even necessary to put every six container, one GPS tracker, it could be only one. <laughs> For the whole train. So they, they, they figured out that, that they needed to have six in order to make sure that they have connectivity at any time. From ah, from okay, 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 okay. Trucks, by the way, is also an issue because if these GPS trackers work, I have asked them to, to, to share the details. If they actually work, uh, trucks is, is easy to track as well. You put the cargo and you give the, the driver the GPS tracker and he gives it back whenever he arrives at the destination. Uh, the thing is, as far as I understand, uh, the low level, let's say, they're not corporate truckers. It's uh, to a large extent, it's a guy owning a truck and that's it. It's not a, it's not a corporate business and they don't really like that you were able to track what they're doing, where they are and so on and so forth. So they don't want to have these GPS trackers on board. Um, but that's also an issue that, that I mean, you can overcome, right? It's, it's always yeah, well, a question of price. So paying $75 quite... dollars more, maybe, maybe, maybe it will start to work. I think it's it's not very difficult because you can put the tracker on container, not on truck, and then that's all. And the, but okay, yeah. uh, <laughs> th thank you, Martin, for very interesting comments and insight. Because uh, really, especially for the audience uh, from Asian countries, for them, Caspian region is a quite exotic destination, and. Uh, uh, that's why our task here also to highlight what is going on in the region and uh, how the Asian part of the world can benefit from this. And uh, uh, and here we have a lot of opportunities and uh, we'll go to our uh, next speaker, uh, Aftab Khatib, who is leading the commercial activity of Caspian Container Company. Uh, it was a very interesting idea which was laying behind the creation of the company, as I know. Uh, that uh, there are a lot of abandoned containers sitting in the region, in the Caspian region, and also, in the, of course, in the Central Asia, like uh, probably hundreds of thousands, probably even millions, uh, and uh, which uh, were taken out of the circulation. And now everybody, I think, listening to the news that uh, there is a big lack of containers on the market, and it's a very interesting situation. On one side, in Asia, for example, in China, there is a deficit of containers, and then about uh, hundreds of thousands of millions of containers just abandoned in the Central Asia. And uh, I will give now the floor to Aftab uh, to explain what they are doing first, what is the ideology behind, and uh, what they're expecting from uh, cooperation with the Asian part of the world. Please, Aftab. Thank you, Murad. Yes, uh, it's true that uh, we were one of the first, in fact, to come up with this idea to use uh, all these abandoned containers in Central Asia for our cargo. We, uh, we do on average about 2 million tons of cargo every year. And we said, why not use some of these empty containers to move our cargo? It's secure. And if it is done the right way, it can even be cheaper. And we, we were successfully able to demonstrate that. Uh, in fact, this year, year to date, we have done about 2,500 containers. Uh, but now we get into, let's say, phase two, where the challenge is that the containers are no longer available. We were the pioneers in this, and now everybody else has 
uh, started copying us. It sometimes so happens that we talk with several vendors and they propose this solution to us. And it's funny because <laughs> we pioneered it. Uh, uh, to also add to what Martin said, uh, yes, Martin, uh, we are also, you know, uh, working on, let's say, a uh, vessel solution within the uh, Caspian Sea. We are working with several uh, vendors, including ports like yourself, uh, uh, rail operators, etc., etc., in to basically optimize uh, and be more efficient uh, when it comes to transport through Central Asia. What I'd like to do now is also talk a little bit more about the topic for today, which is enhancing connectivity and freight in Central Asia. Yes, it is true that Central Asia is an often neglected part of the trade flow. Statistically speaking, the freight volume passing through the region between Asia and Europe are currently less than 2% of what is carried by sea. Very little cargo traffic between Asia and Europe goes over land, except for what goes by rail through the Russian Federation. While it is also interesting to note that the region is rich in commodities and exports them in bulk. This is changing, however. Rail links between China and Europe, both existing and planned, have attracted interest as they offer a potential advantage as against a shipping link through the Swiss Canal. Two potential game changers, the Eurasian Economic Union and China's Belt and Road Initiative, which Martin also talked about, have further encouraged new trade and transport connections in the region. Central Asia also figures prominently in a variety of other initiatives and plans for enhancing connectivity and integration across Europe and Asia. This includes the European Union's Tresessa Initiative and the new Silk Road backed by the United States, as well as various projects sponsored by India and, and actors to promote connectivity in the region, such as the International North-South Transport Corridor or CARAC, Central Asian Regional Economic Cooperation Corridor. Now, some of our observations are as follows. Firstly, plan investments in the region will improve connectivity, but increased transit flows will be a challenge. There is there is significant connectivity gap between Central Asian countries and the most logistics advanced countries. The Central Asian countries can access 50% less economic opportunities, let's say against Germany, for example. Current investment plans will increase connectivity by approximately 8%. But improving non-infrastructure elements of connectivity, such as border crossings, is still needed. By attracting a share of the freight flows from China to Europe, planned infrastructure will contribute to the increase of transit traffic. This will bring challenges along with benefits. On some corridors, freight flows could triple by 2050, putting considerable stress on the region's infrastructure. Transit traffic will also be accompanied by negative consequences in terms of increased maintenance cost congestion, local pollution, and road safety, issues that are already faced in many Central Asian countries. Our second observation is that international infrastructure projects foster investments on main corridors, but shift attention away from domestic connectivity. In recent years, international projects have increased expenditure on rail and road significantly to approximately 1% of GDP, which is in line with international standards. Local and regional roads are, however, in poor condition, as the continued funding of maintenance has left them in a state of disrepair. Existing infrastructure plans focus on key international corridors, but ensuring the connectivity of local businesses to key corridors is also crucial for realizing the benefits of agglomeration economies. Some of these routes will gain a substantial flow increase as soon as 2030. The third observation we have is that the transport and logistics sector needs to be improved with enhanced regional and international cooperation. Transport companies, such as trucking companies, railways, freight forwarders like ourselves, in the region generally face high transportation costs and lack of skilled labor supply. The logistics sector in Central Asia is still in an early stage of development, and logistics costs are high by international comparison. Complex logistics services, such as freight forwarding, customs brokering, third-party logistics are limited. The lack of cooperation and harmonization of rules and standards remains a regional issue and is one of the main reasons why the share of inter-regional trade is only around 5% of total trade. Not all of the signed and ratified agreements are currently implemented and enforced, as there is no mechanism for overseeing the implementation of the conditions and requirements of these agreements. In addition, 
the country still have different standards for the maximum weight and excel loads of heavy goods vehicles and different formal procedures and rules for entering and crossing each country which accentuates cooperation and harmonization problems in the region the situation is complicated by the substantial border crossing time which is especially long due to queuing some borders some borders still do not have official demarcation our fourth and final observation is that institutional capacity is lacking to implement reforms and select projects in recent years central asian countries have shown significant progress at all levels of transport planning governance and regulation however the process used to develop transport policy and infrastructure needs to be more transparent and consistent as well as to be more data driven plans and strategies often miss measurable objectives or budgets impact assessments are rare and performance ass- assessments are carried out irregularly there is a significant data gap which precludes effective planning consistent risk and uncertainty analysis frameworks and their application across different dimensions of planning and governance or across different projects are currently missing some of these suggestions to directly and indirectly address the two main questions of the discussion today are as follows these include our own recommendations as well as some popular opinion uh, we've also taken some extract out from the suggestions from the international transport forum so these suggestions are follows first enhance local connectivity along with improvement of international corridors the main corridors identified by international programs need to be complemented by interregional connectivity various measures can help to reduce the capacity needs or to maintain or achieve certain levels of network performance these measures include actual improvements of the infrastructure example the construction of lanes renovation of existing lanes increase in lane capacity and improvements in pavement quality as well as efficiency improvements example is basically using bigger shipments or mega trucks and consolidation of cargo before its shipment the second suggestion is to price transit traffic to cover its full cost charges levied on road users through fuel taxes and other forms of taxation are currently not aligned with true cost it is recommended that the full range of costs associated with transit traffic is priced in in particular investment rather than just maintenance should be covered external cost including road safety local pollution and co2 emission should also be accounted for this will lead to a cost increase that can reduce the competitiveness of country's transport routes at the international level however measures to improve transport and logistic services border crossing times and travel times can compensate for the cost increase our third suggestion is to reform road investment and maintenance funding there is a clear need for stable funding flows dedicated to road maintenance the fund should be covered through road user charges that reflect the marginal marginal cost of road use rather than through general taxation although several road funds already exist in central asian countries they should be restructured restructured so as to have a strong legal basis act as independent of executive authorities and benefit from in-house technical capacity furthermore investment and maintenance should be allocated through separate budgets it is advised to complement this with systematic prioritization of interventions through better road asset management systems our fourth suggestion is to pursue private investment for cost efficiency private finance needs to be pursued on the right merits to avoid the political and uns- sustainability of private investments in infrastructure the country should keep in mind however that international experience shows that ppps can help to solve the problem of financing but not of funding therefore the government should pursue private investments for cost efficiency efficiency only and in areas where there is continuous pressure for efficiency such as competition the country should also consider adopting international public sector accounting standards to maximize the value for money of private investments our fifth suggestion is support the creation of modern logistics sectors policy makers need to foster the development of the logistics sector through incentives to support professional training and higher education in areas of logistics support and through the involvement of private sector in the design of national logistics policies barriers to market entry should be reduced to attract leading international firms there is a need to enhance productivity in both the rail and road freight sectors through adequate regulation of these sectors our sixth suggestion is to institutionalize best practices in transport planning in a context of increasing infrastructure needs and constrained public budgets 
the Central Asian countries need to maximize the value for money of their transport investments. This country should introduce standards for data collection and ensure continued data collection, updates and sharing between relevant actors. Logistics observatories established at the national and regional levels can serve as data collection and processing centers. Their key activities should include data collection, analysis, dissemination and benchmarking for policy support. Quantitative models should be used for forecasting traffic. Cost benefit analysis should be applied systematically with the level of complexity adopted to the scale of each project. Publicly available guidelines containing values of key parameters to assess cost and benefits should be produced to document the assessment methodology. Example post evaluation of projects should be conducted on a systematic basis to provide feedback. Strategies and other planning frameworks should also account for risk and uncertainties, including their identification, assessment and treatment. Our next suggestion is to set performance standards for customs. Significant progress has been made in terms of customs performance. However, border crossing times are still long and highly unpredictable. Moreover, the variability of border crossing times is increasing. This is of particular importance as shippers tend to value consistency in crossing times more than overall travel time itself. A comprehensive set of performance standards for customs would be useful to identify key areas of improvements and monitor them. Our final suggestion is to strengthen regional and international cooperation. The country should continue developing regional agreements aimed at formalizing their regional rail, road and dry port networks as part of an integrated network. The country should also ensure the enforcement of regional and international agreements at the national level. Executive bodies should receive detailed directives allowing them to enforce agreements. The country should consider establishing oversight bodies and adopting corresponding mechanisms to ensure intergovernmental supervision of the implementation and application of the agreements and related guarantees. In order to ensure transparency for the participating countries and public, the adoption of a mechanism of reporting to an intergovernmental oversight body should be considered. The country should also continue harmonizing freight related standards. Example, train length uh, for heavy vehicles may be maximum weight and axle loads. And also relation legislation in the region with their neighbors. So I think these suggestions in total uh, somehow address the two main uh, questions of the forum today, either directly or indirectly. And thank you, Aftab. Uh, yeah, thank you, because we're already running out of time. But uh, thank you for detailed analysis and uh, suggestions and even recommendations. I think if we will be able to implement at least uh, several of these uh, suggestions, it will be already a good result. Uh, now I, I'm giving the floor to Cristiano Fibi, who is the head of strategy of Integral Group. Uh, he will tell us about the other aspect of the connectivity of the region, uh, actually how to connect producers in the region with end users worldwide, including Asia. And, uh, and he is uh, very much linked to the container transportation. Uh, and also this will enable and uh, continue to enable SME, small and medium enterprises, to be active in commodity trading business because we know now because of the latest uh, problems in Singapore uh, with some bankruptcies uh, and uh, a lot of banks uh, pulled out from commodity trade finance. And uh, now to be financed uh, and to do commodity trading, you need to have equity of, let's say, uh, dozens or hundreds of millions of dollars. And uh, uh, it's clear that small and medium enterprises cannot afford that. Uh, that's why like how uh, for them uh, to, to, to survive and how to stay in the business and still doing, uh, still do what they really uh, used to do and uh, uh, and bring ideas uh, and uh, to continue the commodity trading. Please, Cristiano, I'll close you. Uh, I think I have like five minutes, so I'm going to be uh, giving a probably an abrupt version of what I had in mind. Uh, but uh, so what we are doing, it's pretty much building on uh, what uh, Martin and Aftab are doing, which is, you know, just very nice uh, logistic in place, or let's say it's going to be, uh, we need to use it. And the way to use it is to connect whoever is producing with whoever is consuming. So now I'm going to talk about this wonderful tales of two souls. We have from one hand the producers in Central Asia, which are producing mainly a uh, uh, commodities, uh, but things that you actually need quite frequently, like fertilizers, polymers to make plastics, or even natural gas and energy. And on the other hand, 
you have consumers and the most eager consumers are obviously the one that you find in Asia because they have to uh, foster their growth. Now, what these two people want is effectively, uh, let's say there's an overlap between what one wants and the other one needs. So if you look at the consumer, which is probably uh, not necessarily an end user, but you know, a small enterprise, it could be an, a farmer that needs fertilizers, it could be a small factory that needs to produce plastics. They would like to have access to new, unknown, before uh, producers. They want cheap material, they want reliable, they would like to find information about all uh, the possibilities and technical aspects of the products, and they would like to do it instantly. On the other hand, uh, you have the producers, which are happy to find new customers wherever they are in the world, but they would not like to spend an enormous amount of time and money uh, to develop the commercial route, and also they uh, would like to solve the issue of trust, let's say. They want payment and they want performance. So how do you connect the two? Well, in 2021, it would be very easy to say, oh, that's easy, we just make an online platform, a little bus style, and uh, things will move by itself. It's not that easy because, as we heard before, uh, there's a clear lag of infrastructure, and even if there were the infrastructure, you would still have what Murat was mentioning, the problem of access. There's a very big difference in scale between what producers can accept and what consumers can accept. A consumer is a small farmer. He doesn't have a 100 million credit line to buy 30,000 tons of fertilizer, which he's never going to use over his entire life. He needs something much smaller. Now, here's where we uh, entered in the middle and tried to uh, solve a little bit the issue. So we created um, a web shop, for lack of a better term, where we are actually building up from one side the producers, which we vet, where we uh, make the, the financial effort to make the purchase and uh, to uh, collect the information. And on the other side, customers can jump in on this web platform and they can have inquiries. They can have technical information. They can make orders. And here's the sherry on the top is that uh, we allow them to buy in container size. Because once you containerize the goods, they can literally be shipped all over the world. And the cost is pretty much, yeah, <laughs> see Martin Heavy. Um, the cost is very much comparable to other means of transportation if you take into account what we just listened, that's a multimodal, the, well, the uh, transshipments that you have to do, the loss of time, etc. So that allows direct connection. So what's the advantage here is that you're telling all the middlemen that you need in between. You don't need an international distributor, a local wholesaler, a regional wholesaler. You can go directly and purchase. And how do we solve the issue of trust? Well, we took it on our shoulders. Uh, so we are vetting the suppliers. We are maintaining the relationship with them. And uh, we onboard customers. Now, for the payment itself, okay, it's still in beta. We're not there yet, but the idea is that uh, you should be able to do it directly on the platform. We still have to rely for legal aspects at the moment on the traditional uh, banking channels. Um, but uh, if you're buying just a container, you don't really need a letter of credit. Uh, I'm exaggerating, but a container of software you can buy with your credit card. It's not that <laughs> it's not that expensive. And a farmer probably doesn't have a credit card with that amount. A farmer needs a container, and that's it. So that's where uh, that's the activity we're trying to make to put directly in contact the Central Asian producers with the Asian and worldwide consumers. Hopefully, this thing will keep growing, and at a certain point, it will become sort of a marketplace where our role is just the one of the administrator, and the two souls that we're talking at the beginning will you know complement each other directly. But we're not there. We need to do a lot of work uh, in the background so that the process looks more or less smooth um, to, to both sides. Uh, thank you, Cristiano. Uh, we exactly now used our 45 minutes, but I think we can still go for five, seven minutes more because also Claude Bigley trying to connect. Uh, maybe he will be able, maybe not. Let's see. Uh, but uh, I would like uh, to ask one question. Uh, it's mainly for Martin and Aftab. Uh, 
As per the recent uh, change of strategy of Chinese government, uh, China will not, will now concentrate more on the next, at least for the next five years, and probably uh, also for the other five years, on domestic circulation and domestic market. Uh, and looks like uh, the, they will not be happy anymore to be like a fabri- export fabric for the whole world, bringing raw materials, process it, and export everything to the whole world. Uh, it means that. Uh, uh most probably the volumes uh, which were supposed to go via belt and road corridors will significantly go down uh, and uh, potentially also it means that uh, the project belt and road projects uh, which were already initiated uh, it will be more difficult to implement and finalize but for the new projects it even it will be even more difficult to initiate uh, what do you think how this will affect uh, the connectivity of the Central Asia? Because we just discussed that uh, a lot of cargoes and a lot of ideas also and a lot of projects came from Belt and Road Initiative to the region. Please, Martin, your view. Uh, <clears throat> I don't think it's going to have a huge impact on, on the Central Asia connectivity, if, if, if we call it that, because we have the infrastructure in place. Wimbashi is a brilliant example. Uh, the port is big enough. Uh, there, there's plenty of capacity. Uh, Kazakhstan, we built... Uh, in, in, in the past, there was just product out. Today, we have three ports, and we have another two, let's say, terminals, let's call them that, that has opened up also for cargo. Before they were purely offshore support bases for the oil industry. Now they have started to operate with cargo as well. Um, For the foreseeable future, we will have capacity enough uh, in the port infrastructure. Where we maybe will be lacking is is in platforms for the container movement. And this is something where I think private, uh, private investors, they can come in because uh, if a port is an investment in the hundred million uh, dollar uh, segment, or maybe several hundreds of millions, then platforms uh, you buy a train that's uh, let's say half a million, uh, a, f- a full uh, train. Um, so I think we have capacity enough for the foreseeable future, at least in order to cope with the Central Asia volumes. Uh, I don't think it, it was a very good driver. It was a very good tool to get the governments on board and say, hey, we have this huge potential of the Chinese transit. Uh, and for example, for Kazakhstan's uh, sake, or on our part, we did 1 million TU of transit uh, this year. Uh, and that, that's a significant boost. That's a significant amount of money that, that, that came into the country uh, because of these investments. Uh, along the Chinese border, we have uh, two new terminals that was built again with the with the intention to serve these Chinese transit uh, transit volumes. Two of them in, in Horgos. We have another three terminal projects in Dostuk that are financed and will come off off the ramp within the next couple of years. So we have, I think, uh, I mean, it needs to be a, a macro analysis of it. But but in in my in my view, infrastructure is there today, at least at the border crossings. Uh, what I've top say touched upon is more the softer parts of of, of the, the the hardware is there we need to have the softer parts implemented as well this is customs this is like we like we spoke about as well transparency we need to get those up and running then we will see a boost in volumes uh, it's not because of the hardware the hardware in my opinion is there today and for the foreseeable foreseeable future we will be able to to grow uh, to grow the volumes so so the, the Chinese, if they want to be a part of this or not, I still think that, that we have the infrastructure that we need in order to grow. Porti, uh, there is a terminal investment in the port of Porti now. They will be ready, let's see, uh, by 2025 with a, with, a, with a doubling of their container volume, their throughput. So I think we should be, we, should, we, we are on the right way. That, that's for sure. With or without wow. the Chinese transit. So very good. You are very optimistic on, on this uh, yes. issue. Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Aftab, just please two words, otherwise we are really out of schedule. Yeah, I, I think that it's an opportunity for Central Asian countries uh, to basically use the situation uh, to diversify their economies, come up with new industries and use the infrastructure that there is already in place uh, to diversify. Uh, I believe that 
some countries, Kazakhstan, for example, is already doing much more than others uh, in the region to diversify their economies. But I think the others have to follow suit so that there is no further dependence on China's transit volumes. Although there will still be some volumes going through the region uh, because the infrastructure and processes has been put in place. It is now up to these economies to use that, you know, to go to the next level. And it can be done. I mean, uh, I live in Dubai. I can tell you already in 20 years, this country has changed. I mean, it's talking to be a leader about or the UAE rather is talking to be a leader in so many different industries. And and if you look at it geographically, also in terms of weather, it it's a very challenging environment, but there has been willpower. And I think that's also required from Central Asian countries, you know, in order to capitalize. Thank you. Thank you, Aftab. Now, just final accord. Uh, your three main ideas, how to improve or enhance connectivity of the Central Asia. I'm talking about mainly logistics. Just very short, just one sentence, please. Martin? Yes. <laughs> so <laughs> it's transparency, increase of efficiency, and private operators. Thank private you. Private container operators. Aftab? Sort out border crossings. Uh, agree on standards, whether it is for uh, truck loads, etc., etc., and work jointly on customs. I think these are very immediately things that can be fixed in the immediate uh, or the near future. Thank you, Cristiano. Well, different take. It's empower more uh, commerce and trades by like, investing in. IT infrastructure so that consumers can connect directly. And once the demand is there, the flow will follow because there's an economic incentive to build it. Okay, we have at least seven new ideas. <laughs> Not the new ideas, ideas are already, I think, in the air and existing, but uh, we expressed this, uh, these ideas formally. Okay, thank you very much uh, for your participation. Thank you very much for uh, the information you gave, uh, you shared with the audience. And uh, I believe that uh, there are a lot of things to be done. And uh, but region is the uh, it is the great region, in the middle of the ancient Silk Road. That's why there is no way we need try to try to develop, and uh, this development will come. Uh, thank you again, and thank you for Horacius and Dr. Frank Richter for closing this panel. Thank you. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.